Our topic today is cultural competence in research. One of the goals of cultural competence education is to promote awareness of differences between groups. The Belmont Report provided principles which are highly general. And we have to ask ourselves, how do these apply to specific people? What benefits them? What harms them? How do they exercise their autonomy? One of the risks in cultural competence education, however, is that in the very process of raising awareness of groups, will also contribute to the stereotyping of groups and harm individuals who belong to those groups but may deviate from the norm. Nevertheless, it is important to at least try to raise awareness of differences among the various sorts of people that we're studying. I think it's also very important when we're talking about cultural competence to recognize that this discussion is really rooted in our history as a racist society. And research is part of that culture. So we can see that the historically researchers also perpetuated stereotypes and they exploited disempowered groups for research um, and did not value um, the life of certain um, cultural groups over other groups. On the other hand, we also have a history of excluding these same groups from, from research. And this has led to health disparities, in particular that in medications, for example, people, the um, reactions to drugs uh, and the effectiveness of drugs and getting the correct dosage varies amongst groups. Uh, and therefore, without in including them, that these particular groups have suffered. And I think that raising awareness of some of the differences that exist among groups is absolutely essential to restoring trust and enabling inclusion. Our interview today is with Dr. Veda Sanders Thompson. Dr. Thompson is a professor of psychology at the University of Missouri of St. Louis. She's also a practicing clinical psychologist who has studied diverse groups and worked with various government agencies to assist them in tailoring mental health services to minority groups. But why is it that you think that we need to pay special attention to certain groups as we conduct research? That the general principles are the same, but it's the application that requires the special attention. For example, uh, very often cultural and ethnic groups may have unique behavioral styles, interaction styles, uh, expectations for interaction, that if the researcher were unaware of these, it would be difficult to approach the population in a respectful way. In addition, um, these groups often have unique histories and social position that the researcher would need to be aware of in order to understand whether or not the questions that are being put forward, the research program that's proposed, uh, could be beneficial to this community. And finally, the principle of justice indicates to us that risk and benefits should be distributed equally across society so that if a researcher inadvertently or arbitrarily decides to exclude ethnic minority um, or cultural or linguistically different people from um, the research enterprise, this principle may be compromised. On the one hand, we know that diverse groups have been exploited in research in the past. They've been involved in research that didn't have adequate informed consent that exposed them to inappropriate levels of risk. On the other hand, it seems that we need to include ethnic minority groups and other diverse populations in research that could potentially benefit them. How do researchers weigh these competing concerns and who should play a role in these deliberations? I think you're right that there is a need for inclusion. When we have treatments and interventions that we believe benefit the general population, we have an obligation to assure that they also benefit and are uh, effective with um, cultural, diff different cultures, uh, different linguistic groups, as well as um, various ethnic groups. And if the research is not conducted or individuals are not included, we can't determine that. Uh, and we can't make adjustments in those treatments and interventions that would benefit. And so we would not have that equity 
equitable distribution of risk and benefit. I think it's very important that researchers seek to include members of the community uh, in that decision making about what research is appropriate and how it should be conducted. Those people include, could include researchers from that community, um, lay people, non-researchers from that community, as well as in researchers with expertise in working in that community. Are there special competencies that researchers should possess when they're working with members of diverse groups? Yes, I think that the first question researchers should always ask themselves, do they possess the necessary cultural competence to do the work with a specific group? The first thing that they should consider is whether or not they have an understanding of the demographics and the compositions of the group. That way they can determine whether or not uh, pan-ethnic research is appropriate, and by pan-ethnic we mean research dealing with the major ethnic groups such as Hispanic American or Latino Latina, Asian American, African American, American Indian, or whether they should be working at the subgroup level, uh, which might be Puerto Rican, Cuban American, Mexican American. Uh, this is important because if you're looking at treatments and interventions, culture might affect um, efficacy of a particular treatment or intervention. So that where there are subtle differences in culture, it would be important to understand how that's going to impact, but where you're interested more in how a broad general trend or notion in a culture might impact, then the pan ethnic research might be appropriate. In addition, researchers have to ask about their linguistic competence. Do they understand the interpreting and the translating needs of the population that they will be working with? Do they understand also the expectations for behavior, social interaction, um, style of interaction among um, family members, friends, and neighbors that would allow them to respectfully approach the, the group that they're interested in working with on participation in the research and to continue to respectfully engage them as the research is, is conducted. If a researcher belongs to the population that's being studied, is it safe to assume that he or she possesses the required cultural competencies to conduct that research? I think that's sometimes a common um, misconception, but the answer is no. It's important to understand that assimilation, acculturation, ethnic identity, socioeconomic status can affect the extent to which a person has access to particular ethnic, cultural, or linguistic groups. Uh, an individual may have some sensitivity to some aspect of that group, but it would be uh, unwise to assume that they would have the knowledge base necessary to do culturally competent research just because of a particular heritage. What um, that suggests to us is that cultural competence training should be available to all members of a research team and all of the staff. One strategy that can be used and has been used is development of training materials that all staff access, including tapes, written material. Does cultural competence play a role in specific aspects of a research study, for example, in the informed consent process? Yes, and I think it's important that researchers uh, understand the need to pay attention to language in that respect. The language that's used can affect whether or not there are misunderstandings or misinterpretations. For that reason, it's important for linguistically different groups to use the preferred language of the potential participant. That gives them the greatest opportunity to understand what they're being asked to do and what will be required of them. I think that we should also pay attention to the dialect that they may speak. Researchers also have to remember to translate our jargon and scientific terms into more descriptive language that's understandable. This gives the participant the opportunity to clarify, again, what's expected of them and what they will be asked to do. It also allows them to understand their relationship to the researcher, the institution that the researcher represents, um, as well as how participation might affect their relationships with, to services that they might need. 
Finally, I think for populations that we're concerned with, there may not be the same familiarity with the research process. For that reason, researchers should take the opportunity to educate people about their rights in the research process, uh, what they can and cannot be required to do, their right to refuse participation, um, what the researcher's role is in relationship to them, and how this may affect um, their ability to uh, attain needed services. Are there special ethical issues that arise when translators or interpreters are used in studies that involve people who do not speak English as a native language or as a second language? In the case of interpreters, which usually involves um, oral um, translation of material, there is the problem of um, confidentiality. An interpreter should be aware that they are bound by confidentiality agreements uh, just as the rest of the research team. For that reason, researchers should avoid the use of children, parents, family members, neighbors, or community leaders who might um, affect the act ability to access services um, that the individual might need. The reason for this is because it can affect a person's sense of their ability to refuse participation. It may also affect the quality and the um, openness of the answers that you would receive during the research process. I think in addition in translation it's important that we assess the readability and understandability of the written material that um, has been translated for individuals uh, because those factors will also affect the ability to um, refuse participation if they so desire. It also affects the nature and the quality of the answers that are obtained. In addition, translators are also bound by confidentiality requirements and that should be emphasized as well. Does special attention need to be given to the issue of representativeness within diverse populations? And if so, can you give me an example? Yes, and I think the question that the researcher has to ask is, does the research question pose uh, make the assumption that differences would be found for cultural, linguistic, or ethnic groups? If the, there is no assumption of difference, then mere inclusion may, in the research pro process may be appropriate. However, if difference is expected, then the researcher has to consider uh, the basis for that difference, and that means that we have to look at representativeness based on socioeconomic status, assimilation, immigrant, refugee status, and a variety of other social cultural factors. Um, now, in the case where you are only concerned with a special segment of a diverse group, those representativeness issues may not be as important. You could just focus on that uh, special subgroup. So if you're only concerned about the impact of poverty in ethnic minority communities, you don't necessarily have to have um, diversity around socioeconomic status. Are there any special concerns that arise in research that involves children or adolescents from ethnic minority groups? Here the issue is the different cultural con um, conceptions about the parent-child relationship. Um, and these can lead to differences in, say, how um, members of ethnic and cultural groups may um, choose to talk about their children, the level of information they're willing to disclose about their children and their family. For example, African Americans have a strong prohibition about um, outside disclosure of family matters, uh, and, and researchers need to be aware of those types of cultural norms. How should IRBs address this issue of cultural competence as they review different protocols? Because IRBs have responsibility for the ethical conduct of research, I think it's very important that they attempt also to include members from ethnic, cultural, and linguistic communities 
who can address some of the issues and concerns um, that might be relevant in the research protocols that they're reviewing. As an alternative, if that type of inclusion is not possible, they should designate members of the IRB to become knowledgeable about these issues and to uh, assess whether or not research protocols adequately address uh, concerns that may be relevant to cultural, linguistic, and ethnic groups. Veda, drawing from your years of experience conducting and reviewing research, what do you think we could do to improve the way that we address this whole issue of cultural competency in research? I think researchers have an accepted set of standards for how research should be conducted and for research design. But because of some of the issues with ethnic, cultural, and linguistic groups, we may need to rethink some of our standards. For example, the issue of um, comparison groups and the requirement that we have comparison groups. There are certainly times when a comparison group is appropriate. However, if the comparison group is, is used as a norm or standard against which the behavior, the attitudes, or the expectations of a particular cultural, or ethnic, or linguistic group is judged, then we may be violating the principle of respect for persons uh, and, and the right of, for autonomy for groups. And I think for that reason, we have to think about when uh, comparison groups are appropriate and how they should be used. And finally, I think the inclusion of researchers from ethnic, cultural, and linguistic communities, as well as non-researchers from those communities in the research uh, enterprise, in the development of the questions as well as the development of the, of the design is very important. And at a minimum, researchers should always seek to have individuals with expertise with particular populations included on their research teams. Well, Jean, Dr. Thompson spoke repeatedly of uh, ethnic, cultural, and linguistic minority groups. Tell me, to what extent do mental health consumers view themselves as members of a unique community? They certainly do consider themselves members of a unique community. In fact, uh, some people refer to themselves as crazy folk and have developed other terms uh, for that sub subculture. I think in terms of how you would define that community, um, you need to recognize that they have developed a unique form of art and of music. They have a distinct um, political agenda. They um, also have um, particular values that they hold most important within that subgroup, including the values of choice and autonomy. The value of recovery is, is key. And the recognition of the whole person. So that um, I think it's important to see that this, this is a subculture and also that um, as they're discriminated against within society, they've also been victims of stereotyping. And this has, I think, really led to particular forms of research. Biomedical research in particular has focused on areas that um, from the mental health consumer community, they would think of this as negative stereotyping. For example, the stereotype that people with mental illness are violent leads to studies of violence amongst people with psychiatric problems. Um, the concept that they're hopeless or helpless leads to studies uh, that look at the deficits in people with psychiatric problems rather than their strengths. Um, the focus on diagnosis or the illness tends to ignore the strategies for psychosocial rehabilitation. And even the language of researchers in which people are referred to as schizophrenic, borderline, or the mentally ill. In other words, they're known by their, by their disease as opposed uh, to being called by their name or some language that would be more sensitive. Clearly, these are, are things that researchers working in the area of behavioral health need to be aware of. Let me ask you, do you think that sometimes the values 
uh, differ between mental health consumers and perhaps their family members or people who might serve as surrogate decision makers in the context of research? Well, in some ways, they're bound by shared concerns for the well-being of individuals. They're also family members have been leaders and have joined with mental health consumers around redressing some of the ethical issues within uh, research with people with psychiatric problems. But they differ in terms of values in that um, people with psychiatric problems tend to focus more on autonomy and freedom to choose and even to take risks where family members tend to focus more on protection and not exposing people um, to unnecessary risk and having them classified more as a vulnerable population. Diverse groups with behavioral health problems have been exploited and harmed by research, but they also have begun to recommend that trust must be built and the actions of researchers today must clearly be different from those that led to the wrongs of yesterday. And I think that this mistrust of research is evident in the discussion group. How many people here have heard about the Tuskegee studies? Oh, I'm sure that during that time that uh, African American people weren't, uh, <clears throat> how should I put it, they, they didn't value their existence as much as, as, as other people in, in society. That's, that's why I feel that they did. They didn't value their existence as much. You, you had a segregated society which the whites just for whatever reasons took their anger out on the blacks. and. Uh, do you think that was part of the research, that attitude? In this case, I think some of it, some, uh, uh, racial prejudice came through on us. But this has been, this been, this been down through the years. Before. Mm -hmm. This has been years I have going on. Do you have other examples where uh, people of color have uh, been misused by research? Didn't Hitler do it with the Jews? Yes. Oh, he didn't confine it to the Jews. So I think it was the Gypsies. It was every political opponent who he didn't like. It was the uh, oh, who am I thinking? Oh, the, the, the people who were in poor mental health, the the autistic people, for example. So, do you do you think that those um, those examples have? Um, colored your attitude toward research? Are you a little afraid of research because of what you've heard that has happened in the past? Anybody here? Constantly on the, whenever I, I'm participating in I'm constantly on the defensive. Uh, I find myself putting myself on the defensive um, because I, you know, I don't want to be taken advantage of uh, because I am African American. For example, if, if you send a, a student from, from Harvard University into um, Harlem to do a, a research project. You know, I mean, that student from Harvard University isn't aware of the culture that he's even in. You know, and it's, I don't know. I, I don't know how you would go about addressing that. I, you know, so most of the people that conduct research are, co are college students and university type people, and very and you know, very seldom are they minorities. You know, when you when you talk about PhD. Uh, fellows and all that stuff, very seldom are they minority, so I don't know how you would address that other than maybe if that person could do some research research before they before they conduct the, the studies, if they do some sort of extended research into the, into the, into the black culture or, or the Hispanic culture or whatever they're, you know, where they're researching. Maybe if they did more research into that, they could, they could compensate for, for their lack of knowing uh, how, that, how a black person feels. You know, how these cultures are. Yeah, they can do some. You know, if there's some sort of research that they could do prior to doing their research. I guess is what I'm trying to say. You know, but it, it should know more about the mm -hmm. the black population of uh, how we live or how we are in general, to order to pick up what you know what we do. Raising awareness of mistrust and of defensiveness may be half of the battle. But the other half of the battle is trying to restore trust and what can we do to restore trust in the face of uh, not only abuses, but abuses that people are keenly aware of. 
Well, the second discussion group really got into that topic and identified the training of researchers and also the inclusion of minority researchers as the way to proceed in building trust. A dream of mine was to do research, get a government grant, and to study African Americans in high school, the violence, the drugs, <coughs> you know, things that I feel that everybody just can't get into. So it's just, you know, just a dream. It was just a dream that I had at the time, you know, to get a government grant, go to high school across the country, and do some research. Do you think that as a black man yourself that you could do better research um, for African Americans? For African Americans? Yeah, and such a person just from being on the outside. Well, I can understand them maybe better. I'm not saying for sure, but it was just a dream that I had and I thought I could reach them. <clears throat> One of the growing uh, approaches to cultural competency and building trust is uh, participatory models of research in which the participants of research and their communities are co-investigators. However, I think that all of this emphasis on collaboration has also brought its problems to science. One is the lack of resources uh, within a, a community to be able to participate um, in research, uh, both in needs for technical assistance and for other things like transportation, access to computers, that the researcher really has to be sensitive that they're not taxing the community and that resources are found so that people can be equal partners. And certainly throughout uh, this series, we have talked often about the need to consult with community members in order to design beneficial um, research, valid and reliable research. Um, and this inclusion can range from uh, focus groups prior to doing the research, community meetings, um, uh, advisory boards, all the way to the participatory models that you're discussing where the participant is also a co-investigator. Um, but I've often heard researchers um, express concerns or, or reservations about participatory models. Um, they're concerned that sometimes community members lack the scientific knowledge to be full co-investigators or they'll see that it's an unruly process where you have different interest groups battling for the resources or people who are trying to control uh, the dissemination of results, perhaps out of a fear that the results could be stigmatizing to the group. So um, in addition to the th things that you'd mentioned that we need to do, uh, how can researchers navigate these concerns? I don't think I have a definitive answer to that, but from my own experience as a researcher, I have found that it's really important for all collaborators to really be prepared when they come to the table to have done the homework about research, to show up to meetings on time, to de be defer deferential to people's knowledge. And I think it's that way that you can have a true collaboration.